Um, Bruce Seaver is a visiting scholar at the Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society at Stanford and the Haas Center for Public Service. Also, I'm a lecturer in political science and teach a course in philanthropy and nonprofits. Um, my background is partially academic and partially as a practitioner. I was a director of a private foundation in San Francisco for about almost 20 years and before that was uh, director of the California Council for the Humanities. So if you want to get people to believe something really, really stupid, just stick a number on it. That is the great opening line in uh, a recent book by Charles Seif called Proofiness. So I'm going to come back to that, that idea in a little bit, but it's part of a larger question I want to address as the core of this session, which is how do, we success, how do we assess the results of philanthropic work? That's a seemingly simple question. You put dollars in to a project or an organization, and you expect to get some uh, re specific results out. But it turns out to be a really highly complex question. So we'd like to say that we can trace a specified input into a specified output. Um, we really are looking for something that will give us apparent certainty in our search for solving these huge social problems that we're looking at. But uh, social problem solving really isn't like that. It's uh, more complex, dynamic, and multidimensional than, say, um, a business investment or a controlled scientific experiment. So thus, when we try to talk about modern philanthropy and we try to uh, apply this sort of what I'll call the business model for shorthand, and fixate on uh, seemingly uh, definitive objectives as uh, metrics, here are that one, impact, measurable outcomes, logic models, and data. When we do that, we run into some serious problems. In fact, I would suggest there are three fundamental problems with this approach, with the business approach, that are in fact sort of fatal problems to it. And the first is a set of problems that are, we could classify as empirical problems problems with the practical aspects of trying to uh, assess through hard data. Second is a larger philosophical problem that I'll get to in a second. And third is uh, what I will call a democratic problem. So uh, if we start with empirical problems, um, th this has to do with a whole set of things that people have written about. But one is the vast number of variables that are involved in social change and social intervention. So we have hundreds and sometimes thousands of variables. How do you sort that out? The second one is. Uh, the lack of a determinate bottom line equivalent to something like profit in business. There's a sort of preordained goal in business, namely, do you make profit or not? In philanthropy, it's a, a variety of goals. You can artificially establish a single one, but it is artificial. Third, the problem of indeterminate or very long time horizons. How long does it take for a program that it does, deals with youth development to show results, the results you're looking for? Uh, maybe a year, five years, 10 years, 20, a whole lifetime. Uh, fourth, the issue of randomness. Um, we, this is something that, that uh, many authors have written about, but how, how fundamentally that affects uh, issues of social change. Um, the other uh, fifth problem is the issue of um, the philanthropic contribution or donation investment being a single input among many. So among many donors or among many other factors that are input into the problem. And finally, the stochastic nature of social change. That is, uh, social change that occurs typically in, in steps and leaps and bounces and f sideways movements and so forth, not in a kind of linear direct process. Um, so those are the empirical problems. The second is this, this larger philosophical problem, which has to do with, um, in part, this, uh, what one might call it epistemological issue, that is a theory of knowledge, and what theory of knowledge is being applied here. Um, part of that relates to this question of reflexivity, which has to do with when you're intervening human affairs, when you experiment, are you uh, you are trying to change something in the, in the human world. It has to do with an interactive process with those that are on the other side. It isn't like n a natural science experiment where you pose the question to nature and nature tells you something back. In the, the human world, you have interactivity where the people on the other side also have ideas and meanings that they attach to this, and it's an, it potentially or should be an interactive process. Um, beyond that, there's a larger philosophical tradition that has to do with the conceptualization of purpose and meaning. Uh, sometimes it's been called the hermeneutic tradition. Uh, in, in the philanthropic world, this would involve donors as well as recipients, or I should say recipients as well as donors, uh, in the process of a mutually determined goals, not a goal that's imposed by um, one side. And in philosophy, this is often discussed in terms of intersubjectivity. And Jürgen Habermas describes this as the dialogic rather than monologic relationship with, with uh, the human world. So that's the philosophical problem. Then there's the third, which is the democratic issue. Uh, just quickly, I'll just say what that has to do with a top-down approach toward uh, social change and assessment, as opposed to uh, an interactive relationship between those with resources and those affected by the problem. 
Um, it's pretty obvious that this is this, this democratic issue, if you care about it, is a, is a central question. And it's brilliantly dealt with in a recent book by William Easterly called The Tyranny of Experts. So that's the critique. So uh, it's easy, relatively easy to critique something. It's harder to come up with alternatives. So what is the alternative to uh, what, I was, uh, what I'm describing for shorthand? It's a business model uh, applied to philanthropy. Well, I might just call it something like the collective judgment model. That's, that's it. I'll throw that term out. It isn't maybe fully descriptive. But it's basically uh, something that's described, again, by, this, uh, by the writer James Scott as uh, something called metis. Now, that's a, an ancient Greek term that has to do with experiential learning as opposed to um, another tradition which has to do with uh, the combination of ratio and techne, in other words, theoretical knowledge applied to reality. Um, and the characteristics of metis have to do with being with this reflexivity I was talking about, that is a reflexive relationship and understanding of that, human judgment, multivalent assessment, collective judgment rather than individualistic, something that allows for an evolving problem definition, that is, it is iterative, um, provisional, discovery-oriented, and finally, uh, context-sensitive, very much uh, part of the context from which it's coming. So here's some examples from, uh, from other fields about how this knowledge and assessment process works. So the first thing might be, how are your kids doing? How do you assess them? Do you look at their test scores and their SAT scores and how much money they're making? Those are all metrics. And you do sometimes look at those. But there's much broader uh, criteria by which you evaluate how your kids are doing in terms of values, civic connections, um, relationship to uh, other people and, and, and uh, their own children, and so on. Um, the second is uh, uh, the collective judgment uh, in awarding prizes. And the most notable might be the Nobel Prize. How are those awarded? Not by adding up the number of articles published and so on, although that might relate. But it's essentially a judgment by a group of people, of experts, of uh, what kind of contribution uh, the, the winner has made to really the transformation of, of the humankind. Um, third, uh, jury decision making, yet another kind of, of group decision making that involves judgment. So all of these have in common the process of collective judgment involving more than one individual, multiple dimensions, iterative processes, and interpretive criteria. So what are some examples in philanthropy? Uh, well, just a few, just some ideas of where this can be, is sometimes, often is applied, but is, um, has its own merits just in, in terms of intrinsically its form of judgment. So in education, teachers' professional judgment versus standardized testing. That's a big debate these days. Uh, in youth development, say, assessing civic and social attitudes, preparation for work, specific job skills, confidence and optimism, leadership and resilience. There's some numbers there, but, but a lot of things that aren't. Health, um, there are numbers for sure, things like lifespan and infant mortality rates, but there's lots of others, social mores, access to care, nutrition, a sense of well-being. How do we assess those? In sum, I want to suggest that the blend of judgment, experience, expertise, numbers, of course, included, and feedback from the field is, to my mind, a better prescription for philanthropic assessment than is the narrow metrics of the business model.